Um, so we're gonna be talking today with the lovely Anya, who is the baby reflux lady. She's an absolute expert in this. Um, she's the person to ask if you have a reflux question. So um, I'm going to add Anya in here in just a second. Here she is. Um, bear with me. So I go like this and by magic she will appear. <laughs> Um, there we go. Well, Hello, how are you? Good, yeah, great, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. So this, um, hopefully I'm still live because your face on Instagram has frozen, but I'm still here. Um, <clears throat> we're good. We're under quarantine here at home because my little girl had a fever last week. Um, however, we are managing and it's one of the great things about being able to do things online. So yeah, we're, we're good, we're good. Excellent, excellent. I just saw there was a little pause actually there on Instagram. Um, I think it looks like it's settling oh, down now. There, yeah. Yeah, I think we're good there. Um, but great, hopefully I can see lots of people joining us. So people joining us, if you can please just pop a little hi in the comments, um, that would be really helpful so that we know you can hear us loud and clear. Um, that would be really helpful. Um, yeah, so Anya is an absolute expert in reflux. I know this is something that challenges so many people, some just mildly and others really quite severely. Um, there's no question that's silly and there's no question that's not important. If you have a concern or a question that you'd like to ask them, please do type it in the comments below um, and Anya will, will be glad to help you and give you a steer. Um, so Anya, just to, to start off, um, do you want to share with everybody just a little bit about what you do and, and how, how you can help with everything? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, thank you very much for having me on, Lucy. I love um, any opportunity to sort of get the message out there. As a mum of two, I, we have direct uh, experience with formerly diagnosed colic, reflux, silent reflux, cosmo protein allergy, soy allergy, um, nut allergies, sulfite allergies, and other food intolerances as well. So we've been through it for quite some time. Um, my eldest is now seven and my youngest is five, so we're well past it. But going back, my experience of reflux was horrendous. My eldest wasn't diagnosed until she was five and a half months old. So we struggled every single night. I was told her crying was normal. I was told it was me and that I needed to get used to it and that all babies cry and I was being too soft on her and I kept picking her up and I was making her up my own back and all of these complete myths. And the one thing that I managed to do through it all was to trust myself. And I was like, no, I, I need to hold my baby. She needs me right now. And I'm looking back, I'm so glad that I did. My background before this is mechanical manufacturing engineering of all things. Um, and I specialized for 14 years in corporate life as a, uh, like a problem solver, basically 14 years, professional problem solving, pattern analysis. You know, I was very happy in front of a massive Excel spreadsheet of data, you know, give me data, I'll dig into it and I'll find, find where the underlying cause of problem is. And then back in 2012, I also graduated in traditional Chinese medicine with um, acupuncture, moxibustion, and a bit of nutrition. Now, both of these seemingly at odds um, sort of professions, both led me to the same thing. Every single time, always ask the one question of what's causing this, what's causing this, what is causing this problem? And when we understand exactly what is causing any problem, we stand a much greater chance of resolving it. So after nine months of uh, sleep deprivation, in the depths of postnatal depression, I sort of gave up on asking the medics and asking the allergists and asking the health visitors to help because thus far I had got nowhere and I had to rely on my own abilities. So I started to track everything. Now I was tracking a lot. I had apps for breastfeeding. I had apps for sleep. I had apps for poos. I had apps for almost everything, but nothing was capturing the level of detail, believe it or not, that I thought I needed. So I created a, a, a spreadsheet and I started to fill it in on an early basis. Now my daughter was uh, nine months by this stage. So she was well on solids and solids had made things worse than ever. 
like I thought her sleep was bad before she was six months old. Solids made things even more horrendous. And this is a common theme that we see with babies over six months, that they start to get restless sleep. And I suppose this is where a lot of your people will be, they, they're, they're with sleep issues. And it's why can't my baby lie still and baby's literally doing laps of the cot every night. And it's understanding why this happens. Um, I completely changed my diet. Like I changed, I've tried every diet, whether it was paleo, keto, whole 30, uh, an SCD. I tried being a vegan, being a vegetarian, being a carnivore, um, living on you know, just the mo the weirdest diets, like I did the Ted, the Dr. Sears Ted diet, nothing gave consistent results. And it wasn't, when I started tracking everything, I started to realize that actually the key to this was the natural immaturity of baby's digestive system. Mm -hmm. And then we started to look at that and I started to piece it together and I got a suite of about 10 foods that me and my daughter could eat safely. And our lives changed in that like period of three weeks, but I wasn't content in knowing that we had 10 foods we could eat. I'm like, well, why? Why is this the case? And that's where my research really started to grow and develop. And then I researched that. I figured it all out, according to myself. When my second daughter came along, I had a, I was probably like, the, like a, a ridiculously healthy breastfeeding mum. Um, you know, there was no chocolate around me. There was no sugar. There was no dairy. There was no soy. I had everything else, but she still had reflux. I'm like, oh, what's going on here? And she was here to teach me that she actually had a tongue tie and that was her cause of reflux on top of allergies. Um, and when we got into all the detail, we figured it out. She only suffered for three months, um, which was much better for me from a, in, instead of nine months. And then as she grew up and we went through allergies, I continue to start to read and research this. And actually it was a friend of the sleep, a, a conversation with a sleep consultant, a friend of mine who said, she, you just know so much, like you need to write a book. I'm like, yeah. really? Mm. She's like, you need to write a book. So eventually I did write a book. Yeah. Um, because what I learned is so, so important. And we'll touch on, on, on the, the topics as we go through the questions people have um, asked already. But reflux, the most important thing, if people take one thing away, is that reflux is a symptom. So the medics call it, call it gastroesophageal reflux disease. is isn't actually a disease, it's a symptom. Because it doesn't have an underlying pathology of its own. It's a symptom of so many different things. And this is why there is no one size fits all solution. You know, we get people say, well, try this or try changing the milk or try going to see that person, try seeing that person because that works for us. And people try all these things and still get no answers. And the reason is because what they're trying is guesswork rather than addressing a specific issue for that particular baby. So it's exactly the same with sleep. Exactly the same in that, you know, they, people say, I've tried everything. It worked for my friend, but yeah, was, it's not necessarily the right thing for that child. And exactly, it, exactly the same. And I, I, I love the fact that you've pointed out that, you know, GERD as they call it, it's, sometimes I think people will think well my child has this the doctors have said they've got it nothing I can do and they almost feel like it's sort of not an excuse in a negative way but just almost a out of my hands kind of thing yeah. Yeah. and you know amazing that hopefully today they can take it into their own hands and absolutely um, there are solutions so mm. absolutely and that is my my biggest thing is that with the children I've been working with over the last three or four years, and there's hundreds of families I've supported, 90% of cases are relatively straightforward. And there are those that are, are, are more complex, but we learn with these children and we find solutions for them. Mm -hmm. And then when, when we understand the specific cause for every child, we go, bing, light bulb. We now know what action to take. And the sooner we can resolve reflux, and I can say this like completely honestly, the sooner it's resolved, the easier it is to resolve. Mm, you know? yeah. So I, I have clients, I have one particular um, a friend now, I've been working with her for two years, but her daughter, we caught it at nine months, but we didn't fully understand what was going on and what had been happening for her child completely destroyed her digestive system which left her with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth which takes years to recover from mm -hmm. 
and she's only three. She's able to eat eight foods safely. Like this is a massive journey and this is not because of her reflux, it's because of how her reflux was treated. Okay. So, and she is a rare, rare case, but these are the things we need to be avoiding mm. by treating properly in the first place. And there is, I will say straight up, there is absolutely a place for medication when it works and mm -hmm. when it is the right, re, the right um, way to address reflux for that particular baby. Mm -hmm. But I see in a lot of my followers and my clients that their babies go on medications and there's no improvement or they get worse and yet they're left on these medications and then the doctors all they have in their toolbox is medication that's all they're allowed to do and that's all they've been trained to do mm -hmm. so there's limitations within the system that we're looking for answers from and currently that system just doesn't have the answers it's not the doctor's fault they don't have the answers the system is set up incorrectly so it, it's almost like a, a systemic problem that needs addressing rather than um, you know, we shouldn't be saying the doctors need to know this. Perhaps they need to know it, but at the moment they don't. And there's a process of education for the whole system to go through as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree from a sleep perspective as well. They don't know, you know the answers. I've trained GPs in sleep. Um, I've spoken to pediatricians who and asked them questions and they've said, you know, you know more about that than I do. And, and they've admitted that. And um, it's, it, yeah, um, health visitors, um midwives you know they they have they do a wonderful job at what they do but that's it's they don't have that specialist knowledge about reflux or about sleep um to be able to give the level of help that lots of people need so um yeah. like you said it's not their fault it's just that they do what they do in their scope um, exactly and and so too many children are medicated for things um i think many things where naturally there's a, a more holistic way of approaching things um I, I, I had about a child yesterday who was being medicated to sleep and, and so unnecessary so unnecessary and you're yes. like me i think in that you, you have this passion to when you can see that there are people suffering with a problem that they needn't be and that yeah. you know that could be resolved and that that little one and that whole family could be um in a much healthier place all around you just want to fix it because you know there's a solution exactly and you you said something really important there lucy you you mentioned that it's a family issue mm. reflux doesn't stop with a child it affects mm. the maternal like mental health of mom and dad yeah. you know we we tend to forget about the dads but the dads are going out to work majority and they are worried about their wives or their partners who are stuck at home with this baby who's screaming and they can't connect with them because they're not there they don't understand what's going on mm. they're worried about the welfare for their child when they don't understand what's going on mm. and and then there are siblings in the families and of course a baby who is struggling will always get like all the all the the attention they need but this then takes focus off their older siblings who are left sometimes in pivotal moments and in influential years of their lives going oh okay well mommy's always with baby and this is not this is not about blaming anybody or making people feel guilty because we can resolve reflux and then mom and dad get to figure out how do they work the family dynamic yeah you know because a new child in the family changes the dynamic completely <laughs> um and every family is different but we just we need to recognize the impact of reflux is family wide it really is and it impacts on on parents ability to communicate outside of the family yep. you know i had trouble um connecting with my mum and my sister who were also of the mind that i was spoiling my children and i was overprotective and it's like oh you're always been overprotective i'm like okay that's a hard knock to take but my child screams 20 hours of the day mm. what else am i supposed to do but they were They've never had the experience of reflux. So therefore, they, there was no way they could understand what I was going through. And I suspect that is the same for any parents where there is sleep challenges mm -hmm. and sleep deprivation. People who haven't been through that, you know, and there are some people, my, my sister had three kids who just slept. They yeah. just go, Kum. and my brother's the same. Like he literally had to show his son the car seat and he was asleep. I'm like, 
Can I have them? Can I have them, please? Yeah. Um, and currently, I just hope that when those kids are 16, mine will go to bed or do their own thing and I won't be worried, <laughs> worrying about them. You know, what goes around will come around. But we have to be really conscious that this is all about our own individual trust, doing things our own way, what's right for our families, mm. um, and taking the necessary action. And also as mums, having the confidence to trust our own instinct about our own families and to anybody else who tries to poo poo what we do as parents go do you know what you can go and have your own family i'm not going to come judging you so please give yeah. me the ability to to parent my family especially like you said when they haven't had that experience you know if you haven't experienced it you don't know what it's like for the person who is experiencing it and even if you have your experience will be different to somebody Guaranteed. else's and um, i find it sad when people who maybe have had an easier time or, or have had success with what they've tried um, then make others feel bad if they need to try something different yeah. um, or suggest that it's all unnecessary when they they don't know how necessary it is for that family they don't know that that mum potentially you know is losing her mind and slipping into a terrible state of depression or that it's with Steve, I see this where parents are just unable to function safely. They can't drive a car safely. Yeah. And if you're if you're not in their shoes, you can't tell somebody whether they're right or wrong to try the things they need to try. And and I think yeah, it's the same goes for yeah the reflux. You, if you haven't walked in that person's shoes, you yeah you don't know what it's like for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want to get into some of the questions? Yeah, definitely, definitely. We've got lots of great questions here. Um, I think this one is quite a general question. So mm -hmm. maybe a good one to start with. It came from Sarah Scott and she said, what are the best things you can do for a baby with reflux? So it's quite a broad question it um, is. to start with. And there's some more detailed ones. As well. Yeah. So as we go through, we'll get to, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll tease out a lot of things. However, I am 100% after working in this industry and treating kids for three years, there can be a different answer for every child and every child has the answer for us. It's a bit like playing Sherlock Holmes with our children. Okay? Yeah. And it's a bit like trusting your own gut instinct and going, you know, ask your internal Watson, what's going on here? <laughs> we have to look at everything that's going on for a child. So reflux is not just caused, it's not a one thing only. Okay, reflux itself is regurgitation of stomach contents into the esophagus. That is what reflux is. However, the medics also group in a whole lot of other things into reflux on the reflux bracket that are not actually reflux. So you will see it, um, and I see this quite a lot, a, a lot. I get sort of private messages from people where they're saying, my son's eight months old, he's just been diagnosed with reflux, he's never thrown up in his life what do I do? And literally, these are children where sleep has gone to pot. And the sleep consultant is likely to say, that's probably reflux because your child is in pain. We can hear the crying. We, the type of crying that we hear from this child, um, the fact that they're not able to lie still, it's kind of going, this might be reflux. They go to the GP, the GP goes, yeah, they're not able to lie still, whatever, they're unhappy but they are otherwise healthy and thriving and growing. Therefore, they put it reflux. That's actually an immature digestive system. So that's really important to, to recognize that the medics will classify a lot of things as reflux that in truth are not reflux. So reflux is just this regurgitation specifically. And um, oh, what was, so what can we do in general? The, there is no general thing to do. I don't recommend parents sit there for 30 minutes holding their baby upright every feed because when we address the underlying cause of reflux, that's completely unnecessary. With all of my clients, I ask them to look at over 80 different symptoms and behaviors. And when we look at these, when we track them and we figure out, so there's a free download for anybody who wants it on my, my, um, my website, which is this symptoms tracker. It's a list of symptoms and behaviors and you go through it and you say, my baby has this, they have that, they have that, but it's more than that. 
how frequently do they have it and how bad is it? Like rate it from a zero out of 10 when they don't have it to a 10 out of 10 when it's just there and it's all the time and it's really, really bad. And from those, we pick out what is going on. These symptoms and the behaviors we see give us the patterns of what is going on for baby. And then with these, this, we can work backwards and say, well, based on this set of symptoms, and um, this history and these behaviors, um, and some of these behaviors might be linked to the time of day, they might be linked to um, position, so when they're lying down versus when they're sitting up or when they're in a car seat. All of these things give us the, the clues that we need then to put it together as a pattern. This is why we need an individual approach, because when you're asking questions about 80 different symptoms and behaviors, mm. it's very difficult to get a big generalization. Yeah. But that symptom tracker is exactly where we start for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of it works alongside with the book. In the book, I've written the process of how to figure out what every symptom means in detail. And literally, I could read from the book. We'd be here for about two hours. Um, or, and I've done it in a, an online workshop as well, where I bring people through how you group the symptoms, what the symptoms are telling you. Now, you can go off and do what I did four years ago and Google all the symptoms and figure out exactly what they do. But I have done it for you, and it's in the book and it's in the workshop. But that is exactly where we start with every child. And within, once you have the pattern, you know exactly what action to take, because that is going to tell us what the most likely underlying cause of reflux is. Yeah. And that's the, that's the starting, that is a place yeah, that's for the every child. Yeah, yeah it's analysing, like you said, and, and finding out the, the right solution for them. And I think so many people would go to is, my little one has reflux, I don't want to do, GP gives me Gavis gone. And it's just, yeah. it's not solving the problem, it's masking it, isn't it, at best. You correct. And, if not making it worse and creating other problems. <laughs> yes, yeah, and Gavascon, case in point, um, it's one of the more benign medications because when it goes into the body, it literally just, just functions in the digestive system and when, it, when it's passed, it's gone. There's no, it doesn't chemically change how the body functions, we, unlike the other medications that are prescribed. But Gavascon, um, its purpose is to stop people, to stop food being regurgitated into the esophagus. It provides its very important role means that stomach acid isn't coming into the esophagus. Therefore, stomach acid is not going to burn the esophagus. So it minimizes the chances of erosive esophagitis, which is when um, the lining of the esophagus is physically burned and irritated and red raw from reflux, from stomach acid. And that can be extremely painful. So it has a very positive action in that. However, it doesn't address the underlying cause of reflux and when you start in Gavascon if it works you need to stay on it um, but it also then causes the most horrendous constipation in 96% of clients that I asked I did a survey I did like a little straw poll on Instagram back in August 107 people answered 97% of their babies had, re had constipation like the day after the, the Gavascon started and for some the constipation is even worse than the reflux experience so they stop it again. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So whilst it can help in, like you said, whilst it can help with esophagus pain and maybe in the short term can relieve some damage that might be going on there, it's not the long-term answer. It's yeah. not going to put the reflux to an end. Um, and that's why we need to explore in yes. what, what it is that's causing the underlying causes. The individual. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that makes complete sense and it's like if somebody asks me how do I how do I get my baby to sleep I'm like where do we begin this could be a million different ways so um it does take that analysis and absolutely anyone listening um uh Anya mentioned her um download that she's got that you can do a bit of self-exploratory and her book is fantastic so we'll put um links in the comments later um for anyone that wants to come back and then they can link over to yeah. those um brilliant resources um, here's an interesting question. Um, somebody has asked us, what is the difference between reflux and silent reflux, or are they the same thing? They are pretty much the same thing. When we look at them from a figuring out what's going on, they're essentially the same thing. The only difference is that reflux, the vomit comes up and is vomit, so it comes out of the mouth. In silent reflux, it only comes up partially in the esophagus or to the back of the mouth. So baby doesn't vomit. My daughter had silent reflux, which is 
very often why reflux is completely missed is doctors go, well, they're not vomiting anything. That's just positing. It's like, it's not just positing if it's causing them horrendous pain and, and aggravation. You know, positing can be harmless if it's just milk that hasn't been mixed with stomach acid. If it's positing that's bringing up stomach acid that is irritating the esophagus, um, irritating the back of the mouth, causing any disturbance to baby and discomfort, then that's sort of silent reflux. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so it's whether it's coming physically out or not really exactly. but it's the same the actual action and what's going on in the body is the same yeah. thing yeah um i think this leads on quite nicely we've also been asked is there a particular age range that babies suffer from reflux um how long can it can it last does it <laughs> does it cure itself and can it come back again so it's kind of a few <laughs> questions and uh, um let me know if you need me to repeat that at all yeah okay so age range that they can suffer from reflux they can suffer from the very beginning from the moment they are born which was a case with my eldest um my youngest it started to appear when she was about two weeks old we had two weeks of bliss and we're like oh this is what parenting is being like this is amazing like this is a baby who sleeps um and then it starts to go downhill um it can so there's later onset reflux so you can get the two-week honeymoon period at the beginning you can it can start gradually as in the case with my youngest it can start sometimes after usually after maybe the 12 week jabs um linked to vaccines this is not a reason not to vaccinate there are things we do to support babies' bodies around vaccination rather than avoiding vaccinations vaccinations are quite important um and i encourage all parents to be educated around these things themselves but we can support our baby's bodies around vaccination time to boost their digestive system to um, minimize the chances of, of sort of vaccine related reflux. Um, reflux can happen, it can start like we get this thing of the late onset maybe six, seven, eight months around the time of solids. That's mm -hmm. typically if we're seeing vomiting at that case, um, we tend more to look at uh, it being allergy related, being whatever what suits with, with the solids maybe you're eating. It's not guaranteed to be that. It could be um, related to baby's ability to swallow properly, mm -hmm. which may not have been seen earlier, but when they start with solids, they may not have the tongue mobility that they need. So therefore with feeding aversions later on around food, um, we, we can see reflux happening then. If it's the sort of the wind, the digestive, the lower digestive system later, um, that happens a lot more with babies when they have started solid. So after six to eight months. Um, I don't see reflux, reflux that starts after baby is 12 months old later on. Um, <clears throat> we typically look at their entire diet. So it can start that late, but typically it doesn't. Um, then how long can it last? It can last as long as the cause isn't being addressed. So this thing of does it cure itself and the GP saying, don't worry, they'll grow out of it in three months, they'll grow out of it in, in a few weeks, uh, this is normal, they'll grow out of it by the age of 12 months. None of that is guaranteed. Mm. None of that is guaranteed. Um, which is why possible, I still would you say It's possible, mm. just not guaranteed. Is so it, it, it is, it is yeah, so when we understand the cause, mm. Okay. So if it is the natural immaturity of baby's digestive system, it could take up until they're two and a half or three for them to, grow, for their digest, I don't like the words grow out of it, they don't grow out of it. Their digestive system matures. Adjust to it, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. their digestive system so doesn't suddenly, but gradually matures. So yeah. I like, and this is sort of relevant, I think now, but the digestive system maturity of a child is akin to their ability to walk. Mm -hmm. they don't come out of the womb and get up in a few hours like a like a, a baby horse yeah and off and walk they have to go through so much development they have to be able to lift their head and hold their head up they have to get strength in their arms they have to get muscle control mm -hmm. first they push themselves up they learn how to roll one way and the other they use how to learn their knees they learn that they can bump shuffle all before on the way to standing up getting balanced and walking Mm -hmm. And there is no set time scale for that either. There are ranges, but those ranges are months wide. You know, they are mm -hmm. half a lifetime in, in 
in six in a, a 12 month old baby you're like well they could be walking from nine months it could be up to 15 months before they start to walk you know that's a half a lifetime in their lifetime yeah um window of yeah it's all still normal it's fine the digestive system is the same yeah the point of maturity in a baby's digestive system is when they have all of their milk teeth okay that is the point because funny enough this is the start of the digestive system it's a big mm. tube it's actually an external environment it's a tube that goes from one end of our body to the other yeah you know it is actually like if you've got a um a football and you put a tube straight through it that came out the other side that's essentially our digestive system it's a bit more convoluted on the inside but it is actually an external environment within a tube inside our bodies the maturity of it coincides with the growth of all of their milk teeth as long as there hasn't been any um injury caused to the digestive system along the way so for example a baby who has a cow's milk protein allergy while they have been consuming dairy that dairy can be damaging the mucosal lining of their small intestine which in turn damages their ability to produce the right digestive enzymes which then leads on to food not being digested properly and fermentation and gas and a whole lot of other things that present as reflux for these children once the allergen is fully removed from their body their body recovers and it can take anything from three weeks to three or four or five months depending on what that damage and the level that damage is but what we can say is that the body when it's given all the right tools has the capability to completely re restore itself completely so you know a, a child who has all their milk teeth if they've been exposed to allergen it might be slightly longer for their digestive system to fully mature um but it is that the milk teeth issue is is when babies have generally grown out of it mm -hmm. um that's if digestive maturity is a cause um mm -hmm. it can be the shift from you know it could be people say oh it magically cured when we change bottle so well actually that's just baby getting a better latch on a different bottle mm -hmm. the cause there is, is baby's latch which mm -hmm are again there's several things to look at within that as well however we don't need to just go and keep trying bottles when we can understand the original cause in the first place mm -hmm. and none of these things are guaranteed and yes it can come back if it is allergen based mm -hmm. um if if it's digestive maturity based something like about a diarrhea can trigger reflux to reappear Okay. just because something like diarrhea literally washes out the gut it washes out the digestive enzymes it washes out the gut microbiome which all play a very important role in digestion mm -hmm. and so it takes time three or four weeks of the correct uh, nutritional input for mm -hmm. baby's body to recover from that bout of illness yeah so there are external factors like that that can damage the gut not you know that it's not long-term damage this is normal this happens anytime our bodies get sick but we just need to be if we are aware of it yeah we can immediately revert back to a safe diet of simple things to eat and gradually rebuild and support baby's body during that period mm. um yeah. makes complete sense yeah so it can come back on a temporary basis if it's still there when they when when your kids are four or five that is a long-term thing and we need to be looking at you know i've had a number of clients who ring me kind of my, my child's four or five um what do we do it's, it's never been resolved and it it tends to be um difficult circumstances like they've uh, developed small intestine bacterial overgrowth or histamine sensitivity issue all of which if we address early on can be avoided mm, definitely it's like most things you know if you can if you can address it early it's always going to be easier um, and faster to resolve definitely Absolutely. I think um, I, I was personally wondering this, and somebody has asked as, as well, um, whether or not reflux, and of course the different types, but can it, is there any tendency for it to be more common um, with breastfed or formula fed babies, or can it be equally present in either? Is there you know, neither one? It any? can be equally present in either. Um, it's a very common myth that breastfed babies don't get reflux. Um, mm -hmm that's a big bs on that it i guess because the the theory that 
formula milk um, is potentially a thicker consistency and, and can sustain babies for longer or can fill them more. And I so you know there's some theories about that, but I guess there's a thought that could it be a cause? I don't know, but I agree that. Um, yeah, so <laughs> milk, whether it's breast milk or formula milk, um, the milk can cause digestive maturity induced reflux. And from a breastfeeding mum's point of view, this is really important. It is not the breast milk that's causing the problem. It is something in mum's diet that is crossing over into the breast milk that is causing the problem. And therefore, by changing mum's diet, we can completely resolve it. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really important. So I, and I, this is one of the myths, the BS myths I put on my posts back in August, I might revamp it. But so many mums are told it's your milk. It's, it's the breast milk that's causing reflux. It's not. It's something in mum's diet that might be causing the reflux. But equally, I do not suggest that any mum immediately goes to an, an, an elimination diet before looking at all the symptoms first to understand. Because we can tell when we go through those 80 symptoms of behaviours, I can tell whether the reflux is caused, if it's likely to be caused by something that mum's eating, or if it's more likely to be something else like a latch issue. Mm. Um, so because I get mums, you know, contact me going, I've been on an elimination diet for three months, nothing's changed. Like, well, that's because it's not addressing the right cause. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that putting oneself on an elimination diet is really hard work. It takes dedication and it takes resolve. And when you're getting the results from it, it's very easy to maintain. Mm. But if you're not getting the results from it, it's very, very hard and disheartening and can make things worse for mum and for her mental health. So it's really important that we fully understand exactly why we're doing particular things and for how long to try them for. Like I, I anybody where I think there's a likelihood of um, a breast, something in my mum's breast milk, it's two days of a dietary trial, two days. Wow. If you don't see a change, then it's not your diet. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's so yeah. fast. Now you won't see 100% change in two days, but you will see noticeable improvement yeah. if mm. that is the underlying cause. Mm. So this is where it's really important, you know, because I, I have done eliminate, uh, elimination diets myself for months, mm. but they worked for me because I knew exactly what I was doing. Mm. And I knew on the day when I went to the pub and we accidentally got butter on the vegetables we had three nights of hell, oh. but I was able to say, do you know what? We'll get through this because that was a mistake. Yeah. We knew exactly what it was. We knew what caused it. I was like, fine, we'll just batten down the hatches for three days. And when we emerge, we're back to normal again. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we really need to understand what's going on. Now what's in formula milk? So this is where breastfeeding is more flexible. We can control all of the ingredients that go into breast milk just through controlling and understanding what we're eating we can't we have no control of what's over in formula but i do go through there are some formulas that are uh have a tendency to make things worse and there's a, a 10 minute video on my facebook page about milk thickeners and thickened milks and why i don't agree with them as a as a way to address reflux because again they're not addressing the cause they're making the milk harder for the stomach to regurgitate mm. and they might resolve the they might therefore resolve the vomiting issue but they can cause a lot of digestive issues discomfort mm. and constipation so mm. like my baby doesn't have reflux anymore but they've got the world's most horrendous constipation so they're on their you know they're on a meprazole and they're on maybe gaviscon which is stopping that they're on a thickened milk as well and they've got the world's most horrendous constipation so they're on Movicol and they're like you know this is these are babies under 12 months old on three or four or five different medications. Mm, yeah. When actually, if we address the underlying cause, they don't need to be on any. Any of them. Yeah. If they're, um, so with, when we were talking about silent reflux, and obviously you're not going to actually see the vomit, could, you some t could it sometimes go, well, like you said, it can be missed, but how would you know, or how would you suspect that because I know I've seen and experienced myself babies where they're irritable when it comes to taking their milk they they want it they're hungry but then they're kind of 
kind of come they, they desperately want it like um, I'm picturing like trying to give a baby a bottle they really really want it want it want it but then they go no oh no and then they're pulling up their knees and then they clearly they hurt yeah is that a sign would that yeah. be a, yeah. a, a, kind of a hmm. absolutely so it, again it may not be it may not be silent reflux there may not be up here it might be digestive discomfort that they have okay. mm. um there can be so many um the reasons which is again why we need to look at all of it so i basically mm. so i've got there's a blog on my website as well about symptoms to look for basically it's the list of 80 symptoms um if your baby has four or more symptoms on that page and you feel they're they're more unsettled than they really should be then we mm. can do something about it Mm -hmm. And they may not have a diagnosis of reflux or silent reflux. They may have been classified as colicky. Mm. They may not have been given anything, but you just know, like everybody might be saying, they're perfectly fine. This is all normal behavior. But in your heart, you know that your baby is uncomfortable. Yeah. If there is, yeah, on that blog, if there are four symptoms present, there is mm. something we can do about it. Because four symptoms is enough to see a pattern. Yeah. But I've never had, I've never had anybody come back to me and say, we've only got two symptoms and it's really bad. That kind of, what I usually get is like, oh, we've got like 20 of those, like that's my baby. Yeah. And it's because, it's because we don't know what we're looking for. There are so many behaviors we see in babies that we don't necessarily link back to um, being caused by reflux type pain or digestive maturity type pain. Mm. But when, like, and this is what I go through in the workshop in quite detail, when we link it all together, it's like, ah, light bulb, light is okay. Yeah. yeah, I understand that. Like the sleep issues, the sleep issues in a baby who has reflux. And, and do you know what? I'm pretty sure, having worked with a sleep consultant myself many years ago, sleep issues aren't caused by sleep. They're caused by something else, somewhere mm. else, mm. be it routine, be it diet, be it yeah. connection, whatever it is. There's, and this is why this individual approach is so important. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, in my, if for my daughters, I think I was, I was a very lazy, fair mom. I was like, oh, we'll, we'll eat when she's hungry. We'll do this and the other. My sick consultant, like, you've got no bloody routine. I'm like, no, I don't do routine. I feel, I feel put down by routine. I like to be free. <laughs> I love routine now. I have a meal plan <laughs> seven days a week. We know reason. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> but it frees up my headspace elsewhere um but like i was really intrigued i i went in and I, I started to behave describing all her sleep behaviors and then i came back to this question well what's your day like I'm like, what do you mean what's my day like like the day has nothing to do with, we're talking about nighttime she's like no just humor me let's go through everything and she took such a detailed uh list that when she actually you know after 20 minutes of asking me questions she's like right this is what we're going to do i'm like okay okay i've invested in this and i did it and three days later i had a child who was sleeping yeah there you go funnily enough and yeah. I'm like, okay yeah. and it was my lack of understanding of all these things and you know when it this is why we have specialists in these areas yeah they'll ask the questions you wouldn't think to ask yourself they'll explore the things you think are fine but yeah. actually they're relevant. And yeah, I, I probably exactly like the lady you were working with. I, I ask questions that people think, no, but that bit's okay. <laughs> the problem's yeah. over here and I'm like, no, 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 this is connected. We, I need to explore this. I need to understand this. And then when it all comes, becomes clear and they understand, oh, okay. I now see how that's linked. And yeah. It, yeah. It totally, totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's the same with reflux. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's so many questions I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to group them because I know some are similar to others that have been asked. Um, is there a way you would class reflux as being under control or is it something you say is you either, it's either a problem or it's resolved or can you have reflux that is under control? Yeah. So, um, reflux will be under control if it's with medication. Right. Okay, and the medications are typically well, it used to be ranitidine. Ranitidine was recalled back in November, so very few babies are still on it. Um, but they're on a meprazole or some variant of it. And, and I use the active ingredient name because there are so many brand names like there's Losec Mups, there's Zantac, there's no Zantac's ranitidine, there's Nexium. Um, and I people go, Oh, my baby is not on, on 
omeprazole, duranlosec, mopsacite, you look at the active ingredient. So anything that ends in azoles, we've got lansoprazole, pantoprazole, omeprazole, esomeprazole, any of these are a PPI medication. What they do is they change stomach acid and it would be under control when parents describe it as baby doesn't have reflux anymore, but they need the medication. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's not gone. It's but not it's, gone. It, it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if they took the medication away, the reflux will come back. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Because it, the cause hasn't been addressed. Um, and then I suppose if it's dietary related, it can be under control with diet. And if it's under control with diet, it's like, it's not there at all. It's gone completely. If baby or mom has the wrong food, it wears its head. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as that food, the, the irritant food is removed again, it's gone. Yeah. So I, I don't, again, I, I don't like to say cure baby reflux because it's not a disease. Mm. Um, I say resolve. We can completely resolve yeah. it. And yeah. then, you know, this is like so many things in life. You can say, I got over about diarrhea. I'm done. I'm never getting diarrhea again. It's like, oh, <laughs> then you'll get diarrhea. And you're like, okay, but I know how to deal with this. Yeah. It's fine. We'll get over it again. It's like, I have a cold. That's fine. Mm -hmm. My body learns this particular bug. Like we're all going to get coronavirus. Most of us will yeah. be fine. Yeah. And if it comes again, yeah, that's fine. It, it's, yeah. it's this process of our bodies learn how to manage it. We mm. learn how to manage it. Mm. You know, it's like a child learns that if they stand on a bee, they're going to get stung. So they're going to watch out for flowers on the grass the next time. <laughs> okay. so, um, so we can never say things are going to go forever and that's it. They're done. Mm. We understand why they're there. And then we address that particular reason of why it has occurred and yeah. it's resolved again. Resolved. I think that um, we, we get asked a lot um, about reflux where a parent wants help with the sleep um, and everything we do is behavioral and, they, and we can identify behavioral challenges that we know will improve the sleep, but there is reflux present. And so a parent will say, well, but the reflux is under control. So therefore, can we go ahead? And I mean, we ask a certain amount of questions about reflux and we're not reflux experts at all. I'm not a reflux expert. Um, but so I'm not, I'm not there to resolve the reflux. I'm there to help with the sleep. And it's a case of then, can we navigate around this reflux that's present? And so I think that's why that comes up a lot with us is it's, it's under control. And I think they think that that's the green light then to go ahead. So it would be so lovely to be able to say, well, look, we'll work on these things, but you should definitely go and have a look at, you know, go and, go and talk to Anya about um, resolving this reflux at the same time so that you get a much better solution all round and yeah. um, Wilbur's on here saying their reflux is resolved thanks to Anya no need for medication so that's great news. Um, so there we go um okay uh I'm, I'm seeing what else I can cover and fit in it's um uh, oh yeah I, th I think I kind of asked this is there a way to tell when a baby is upset due to reflux so it's a specific can you identify reflux pain i guess as opposed to a general fussing baby is there a way to identify that i think that kind of leads a little bit back to what i was asking about the discomfort but do you have any particular things you see um when you know with a baby when you know they can't tell you and um is there any particular reflux I'm just... rise or signs in that respect so this is where mom's instinct, instinct is 100 percent. so there you is know, don't you? you do you do yeah. there is a high-pitched cry of a baby in pain it is not like a normal newborn cry or like a normal child's cry and mm. if you're the parent and you hear this cry you will go my baby is in pain mm. it, it just gets you in your heart no it's um, not yeah. fuss Mm. and the doctors will tell you that that's not they're just crying it's like mm. it's not just crying there is a high-pitched shriek that every single parent of a baby with a child with reflux will tell you yeah oh, that's reflux pain that's yeah and it may not be reflux pain but that is a child in pain mm. um mm. if you feel as a mom that your baby is crying too much if they are more unsettled than you think they should be mm. then have a look at the symptoms page on my blog um, and if they've got four symptoms, like this is where you have to trust yourself. 
you know, babies, babies want to be happy. There is no such thing as a grumpy baby. Or they might be grumpy, but they're not born grumpy all There's the time. There's a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, they, if they're grumpy, if, if you would describe them as a cantankerous little baby, which very often when I see, oh, I've got a cantankerous baby. Actually, your baby, your baby wants, to, wants to, be to be happy. They are born, they are born happy, happy, but something is causing them to be a little bit more unsettled. And for some, it's not, it's not life-changing crankiness. So we don't have to do anything about it. But for, for others, if it is having an impact on mum's sleep more than you think it should, like if you're only sleeping for bouts of an hour at a time or an hour and a half at a time, yeah. if things like a three or four hour sleep, even in the early days, are non-existent, then there is reasons. Why is your baby waking up after every 45 minute you know, cycle? Mm. You know, if that doesn't, because you as a sleep consultant, you'll know an awful lot more about the sleep patterns and what is deemed normal. But if babies aren't able to sleep through that sort of, you know, is it a 45 minute gap where they come up out of the deep sleep? and they, Yeah, around 30, 30, 40 minutes in, they transition, but some, mm. some don't make it through the transition. So instead of going all the way through and then completing the light sleep and then coming right the way through and then knitting it into the next cycle, they actually almost wake, well, they wake prematurely. They wake on the, the rise out of deep sleep and then yeah. they don't even do the light sleep bit. Um, yeah. That's really common. Yeah. And that is... So if that is persistent mm. and, you know, babies have never napped, they've never done more than that one sleep cycle of a nap, then I say there usually is something disturbing their, their body that's waking them up prematurely. Mm. And that's where we need to look at. And again, have a look at the symptoms vlog on my page. See, has your baby got four or more of those things? Mm. Is it something that is causing the body to go, oh, I'm not, I'm not ready to wake. And I liken this to... Um, after Christmas dinner you know the <laughs> days when you've just eaten so much you sat there and you're like I can't even focus on the film like, <laughs> you're laid back you're stretched out you're like I've eaten so much that I don't know what happened in the last 10 minutes of the film like you mm -hmm. just can't concentrate on anything and you still Everything can't sleep is working on digestion isn't it every part of you and sometimes you fall asleep adults fall asleep after a big meal because they can't function every bit of their functioning is going to digesting all of that food <laughs> yeah and then at the same time they're not going to stay asleep past the first sleep cycle because mm. their body is busy and it's like oh no we can't go into deep sleep we can't get there because we need to do stuff mm. um or if you're bloated um if you're feeling ill there are those times when you just can't sleep, even though you're exhausted. Yeah. And again, that's your body going, this, this, it might be pain or it might be an ache or an, a discomfort. Your body's like, I'm too uncomfortable to sleep. So I'm not going to let my brain sleep. These are the times when we can take um, educated intervention. You yeah. know, this is not a try this, try that, try the other thing. This is very much, let's take two or three days of things remaining as they are to get the right answer that will make a shift change. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hmm. We have um, somebody who's asked on, on this, um, her baby is seven months, has sickness with milk and food, but doesn't actually cry or seem in any pain at all. Is that likely to be, and there's not really a question there. <laughs> it's just sort of, she said okay. saying that, but I mean, I think she's curious, like, well, she's not seeing the crying or, or any signs of pain, but being sick with milk and food, um, does that sound like reflux or could that be more likely an allergy or as everything else it needs assessing, doesn't it? You need to assess everything to see whether it is allergy based or milk based, um, allergy based or um, latch based. It mm. could be something like a tongue tie an mm. undiagnosed tongue tie especially if they're bringing up food as well so there's a lot more questions to ask there about babies behavior around food behavior around when they're drinking their milk yeah. um the timings of when milk and food come up um you know is it immediately is it half an hour later is it two hours later so again these are all the, the patterns and the details that we need to be looking at before we can give a very specific answer mm. Yeah, and I think if they're not particularly in pain... Do you want me to look? There's a few questions at the top. Lisa, oh, sorry, you've just... 
I've yeah. lost you completely. Hang on. All right, it looks like we've just we're reconnecting somehow. I've got you on on Zoom. Yeah. If you can hear me, we're just oh there we go. It just um paused and reconnected. There's a yeah. bit of a there we go. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so if she's not if she's not seeing signs of pain, maybe it's early days, maybe it's not causing so much um, like of the burn, uh, but she's definitely getting the, the bringing, you know, bringing up of the food and the milk. Yeah, there. yeah. And I would, it would raise concern because we should be able to eat and keep food in our stomach. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's, that's the issue. So it is, it is worth investigating why it's happening. Mm. Um, because otherwise this, this child could end up growing up and this becomes their norm, mm. but this isn't, it's not normal. It's not it's normal cool. to be able to bring up every bit of food that we eat or every time we eat, we vomit. And like, if you yeah, describe or, I mean, this is what I say to parents, mm. if they go to the GP, if you were happy to go to your GP and pretend your baby symptoms were your own, would you walk out of the doctor's surgery happy with the answer of, don't worry, you'll be fine in 12 months time. <laughs> You've just got to get through this. It's completely normal. We wouldn't. Now, as I said at the beginning, our doctors don't have any other training that, that tells them to say differently at the moment. And I am working to train lots of people in doing what I do. It is going to take, you know, I would love to magic and train all the GPs tomorrow. I'm kind of realistic. That's not going to happen, especially because they're busy dealing with coronavirus and learning all yeah. about that. But again, three weeks ago they didn't know anything about coronavirus so doctors have to constantly learn we can't keep putting everything on doctors they know what they have been taught and they have to they are general practitioners which means they have to have an awareness a huge awareness a across the entire population of everything mm -hmm. and then when we go to a pediatrician we might expect them i would expect a pediatrician should know this and the gastroenterologist should know this but they don't because it has never been taught to them. Mm. You know, this was, this is my discovery about putting all these bits together. This is my engineering brain. Going, well, why is this happening? And why does this happen? And why does this happen? So at yeah. the moment, me and my students are the only people who have this specific knowledge to do this. Um, and I want to, I just want to make this knowledge available as far and wide as I can. Um, mm. Which again is why there is a book and why there is online courses so yeah. that, it is available to people. Definitely. I, I hear you. Same mission, different topic. <laughs> exactly. So, um, we have, I don't know, we're running close to time, but we have um, a, a lady who has asked, do you recommend changing formulas to see if it will help reduce the sickness? I think I know what you're going to say, but I'll let you answer that. <laughs> Not without knowing what the underlying cause is. Yeah. It exactly. could be, it could be that when we would see from the symptoms, we can see very quickly if it is a change of milk needed, or if there's something completely that's not related to milk at all. Um, so yeah. It's, it's just about, going through all the formulas is not gonna be, um, you know, I mean, you can spend a lucky. Lot of money. Exactly. Yeah. You can spend yeah. a lot of money and a lot of time. Um, the, the book will help you figure it out. So this is the, the Baby Reflux Lady Survival Guide. That'll help you figure it out. It's got a process as long as you have time to read. Um, and that's like from 863, I think on Amazon, and they do an overnight delivery. Um, or the reflux course, which is, you can get my website and within an hour, you'll know what to do. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I have distilled the first part of the book into a workshop that where I walk you through exactly what we're seeing in patterns and why, and then what action you need to take based on the, the, the set of patterns that are there. Amazing. We will put the link in the comments because, um, I think that's such a valuable resource. It really is well, everything you do. Um, Somebody's asked a very sleep specific question on here. Please do pop that over to us on our DMs. We'll, we'll cover that separately because this, um, this is about reflux today and that's entirely about nap patterns. Um, so we will, we'll help you um, separately there. I'm just scanning through to just see if there's anything. I've just seen one at the top from Victoria Waters. She answered her answer Great. earlier on. So I'll just, um, so yeah. three and a half month old is really unsettled. May have silent reflux. Also issues with excess, with bloating and excessive wind. Are they linked? Yes absolutely 100 percent, victoria they are they are directly related um and once we understand what is causing the silent reflux and what else is going on because it's i guarantee you it's not just bloating it's not just excess wind there are other symptoms in there then we can figure out exactly what's going on 
um, address that and then the bloating in the wind and the reflux should all go the way together. Excellent, excellent, excellent answers. I'm just uh, looking through uh, uh, some of them are more. Oh yeah, there's a nap one. There's a couple of naps that's, yeah, we'll cover that another time. Or, or as I said, drop us a message with that one. Um, we're looking at um, covering some questions on our YouTube channel. So, oh. Oh, I've just got knocked off there, Lucy. Um. Hold on. Oh, yeah, the, the Instagram feed has just shut on us. Um, it's, it, it cuts us off at an hour, doesn't it? I, I forget that. I often only do half an hour ones and it's just cut, it just cuts us off. Um, we're still on here uh, and that's that's there uh hopefully i think we were just about closing off on there anyway with those questions so um perhaps we if we can we'll do a little wrap up on here and then um uh we can share we can share this to all, all of our groups anyway yeah. um but i think we've covered most of the questions um i mean i have had a few people ask and i know this is a question we get a lot with our our clients about helping to make babies more comfortable when they sleep um i think that's a big one i have heard it with little ones that um, swaddling can help. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, swaddling is a very individual child thing. Mm. It works great. Again, these are all things where we need to understand what's causing baby's reflux in the first place. Um, if swaddling helps, then great, but it, swaddling doesn't address the co a, a cause of reflux. You know, so it goes back to that's, Masking it. Swaddling is what I would definitely refer back to you and sleep people going, well, if that's actually a sleep issue if it's helping them sleep. Um, because they're looking at sort of the Moore's reflex and things like that and just bringing them into themselves. Um, but again, always address the underlying cause. And typically with babies, especially the younger they are, if we address the reflux, then it stops their body being woken up. So they are, that we get a marked improvement in sleep first. And then it's the, 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 the job of, of the sleep consultants like yourself, Lucy, to then understand, well, now, now that the reflux behavioral issues have stopped and the sleep issues on that, what are the genuine uh, routine related or, or other behavior related to life and the child and their life that are interrupting, disturbing, disturbing sleep patterns now that they, um, their body can sleep? Mm. Yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, there are things that maybe in the short term people want to try to just to try to make it a little easier on their little ones. But ultimately, they need to look at those underlying causes and address the actual cause, not the symptom, like anything, really. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and this has been so amazing, Anya. I could keep, I could just keep asking you questions myself. I really, yeah, I'm quite happy to talk. I, 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 I really could. Yeah, I think, um, I think we've answered most things. Uh, there's a few things that have come up about sleep. I, I, um, how was reflux diagnosed? I. Yeah, a GP will diagnose reflux based on, um if mum marches back into the surgery 17 times in the same week saying there's something wrong with my baby, there's something wrong with my baby, they'll go, they're gaining weight. Um, they're generally healthy. There's no illness there. And the GP will go, it's probably reflux. Do you think diagnosis of reflux is often guesswork? Do you think, do you think people get a diagnosis of reflux when maybe when maybe it's reflux or the doctor doesn't necessarily know for sure but it looks like it could be and so that because i think it's hard to the word diagnose is quite yeah oh, i don't like that word because sometimes it's like it puts a stamp on something and it might be incorrect yeah. um or it might be correct but then what do you do because a diagnosis doesn't mean like I said, oh, well, that's what it is. Can't do anything now. <laughs> it's, not, it's not really binary. And okay. the truth is, I don't think baby has reflux. What baby does is baby's body refluxes. Mm, mm. Regurgitates milk. Yeah, I like that. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a disease. It's a symptom. And mm. this is where, I mean, my, my biggest challenge is getting through this. Well, my doctor doesn't know, so therefore nobody else can. So, mm. 
<laughs> in a world where we expect our doctors to know everything and i th i think that's unfair on our on our gps on the medical yep. practice yep um the medical practice has done what it can to say well this looks like reflux they will also tell you the only guaranteed way to diagnose reflux is to stick a tube down your baby's throat as far as the, the bottom of the esophagus to see yeah, but it's called pH monitoring to see if there's acid coming out of the stomach or not. That is the mm. only way they will guarantee a diagnosis. That's, yeah, that that's what it is, or that's what's happening. Like you yeah. said, they don't have reflux. They they are currently refluxing. <laughs> we don't need to do these tests. They tell us nothing more than what we can see by looking at the other 80 plus symptoms and behaviors of what's going yeah. on. With our child. Now we often get colic will be incorrectly diagnosed. Um, and by the way, colic is not something we just need to get through. <laughs> colic and, and reflux have the same underlying causes. They are the very same thing. Um, babies grow out of colic just because they actually mature. They take a, their particular development curve means around three months that they they have moved past it. Mm. Our daughters were both diagnosed as colicky. Um, and when they, when they didn't outgrow the colic, it became reflux. They're like, well, no, actually. And, you know, colic is like this term that we say, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. Mea culpa, can't do anything. It's like, no, we can if we choose to understand what's going on for our children. Mm -hmm. And there's no, like, there's no guarantee that a baby who has been diagnosed maybe at three or four weeks with colic, that by 12 weeks it'll be gone. There's no guarantee of that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are so many parents living in hope going, oh, tomorrow my, oh, my baby's three months tomorrow. Call it be gone, call it be gone. They wake up and it's still just a rerun of the same. Um, for because another. like you said, it's a symptom, isn't it? And I think I find it really hard to get my head around the um, concept of diagnosing a symptom. You know, you're, you're kind of, in my mind, you diagnose a condition, yep. or, you know, a, a disease, a, a um something that then requires a cure but a symptom isn't in my mind something you can diagnose it's something you can acknowledge it's something you can recognize and then it's something you can address exactly. um but i wouldn't be looking to diagnose reflux or diagnose colic i'd be looking to just identify yeah, yeah. And, um, absolutely correct and then move forward yeah um okay um, i mean the, i think there's only one other thing one other question i can see here that I, again, I know the answer is going to be, let's find out what's causing it. But I think with the, the question is, are there any recommendations with regards to feeding and sleeping in a routine? And I know you said earlier, you don't recommend that parents just spend hours holding their babies upright and winding them. Um, it's a natural reaction to do that. You think, well, if my baby's uncomfortable digestively, let's try and ease that before I put them down. Um, ultimately, they need to find out what's causing the reflux and what's causing that discomfort and, and resolve that problem. But I suppose, are there any things, um, if you have a baby that is suffering, that would help or that they could consider in their routine? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I completely get the importance of routine. Um, this is from somebody who was not routine-based at all. Mm. However, if a baby is in pain and is struggling, you can't put them in a routine. Mm. It, is, it is unfair to them to respond to their needs going, I'm sorry, you're not having milk for another hour because that's what the routine says. Um, equally, I understand that mums then get stuck feeding for an hour and a half at a time. They get half an hour break and then baby is making all the feeding symptoms again. You know, you can't be hungry, but you've just eaten and now we're sitting down again and we're constantly feeding. There is a reason every time. Like babies who want to feed all the time are usually feeding for two reasons. Either, neither of them being hunger. Um, they are feeding all the time because they have stomach acid coming up and they know that feeding washes it back down into the stomach. And or they have digestive discomfort, they've got wind and bloating in their belly um, or are constipated and they know that when they suckle, it's one of the few things babies know for a guarantee when they're born, when they suckle, they stimulate their entire digestive system and it moves things out. And this, I mean, that is the reason why as soon as the baby starts to feed, They'll, they'll get a poo and you're like, I've just sat down. It's like, 
that's just nature. It stimulates the digestive system. So it helps things move the correct way. So a baby who's feeling constipated or bloated, they know that feeding helps ease that. A baby who wants to feed all the time because they're refluxing, they know it washes stuff back down. So they're mm. just, they're looking for that comfort to get their body back to a place where it's not hurting anymore. Mm. Again, neither of those things address the underlying cause of reflux. So this is where when we address the cause of reflux, that behavior goes away and baby starts to understand when they're hungry. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of just feeding because it's serving another need. And yeah, we see this from, it could be feeding in the way you've described because it's taking away another pain or, or um, addressing the, that discomfort. And we also see it sometimes as a, um, habitual thing that they want to suckle and soothe for comfort um when actually they're not hungry and they need another form of comfort to soothe and, and often that's to sleep if they've been feeding to sleep um it makes complete sense um i have i have one last question if it's okay and this is a bit of an out there one um do you think and this is a bit of an evolution question but do you think there's been a rise in reflux digestive discomfort these kinds of things do you think it's on the increase due to the modern world we live in the foods that we eat that you know that we give our babies and that mothers are eating and that's going into breast milk and so on um babies are bigger these days than they used to be a generation ago i mean do you think this is a problem that's always been steady or do you think it has Come up. definitely increasing and it is completely related to the general health of the population mm -hmm. um, things like tongue tie and latch issues um are uh, they can there's a theory that they're linked with the, the development of the mthf4 gene i'm not going to say the long word because i can't remember yeah. um it's not one i've studied enough but it's sh it, it's demonstrating that our over prescribing of folic acid Mm -hmm. in pregnancy um is actually undermining baby's neural tube development mm -hmm. and instead of folic acid people should be taking folate which is a usable form of, of folic acid now this is really i mean this is a really important thing and um heather oh, i can't remember her surname she's an american blogger on mommy potamus if you search mommy potamus and tongue tie or mtha4 you have she has written the most incredible paper describing the link and this is one i get all my students who i teach what to do to do what i'm doing i get them all to read that paper it's like one of the recommended readings um because she walks through and explains this link and what what moms pregnant moms should be having folate it's really important for the development of the neural tube correctly folic acid actually in some can inhibit that development so it, it directly go against what we're trying to do so therefore we're getting lip ties and tongue ties and latch issues becoming an issue and um, there's a lot more intervention in birth so uh forceps mm. ventus um c-section all of these things can contribute to constipate uh, not to, to reflux so therefore mm. with the increase in those mm. we have an increase in reflux and also the food that we're giving to babies be it mum's diet or uh, what's in formula like what is in formula has changed so much mm. over the last 20 years and it is causing problems so mm. things like i found this on the web um <laughs> sorry siri wants to answer a question oh it does that doesn't it you get these kind of yeah. <laughs> you get worried about when he's listening to me sometimes <laughs> <laughs> but so if you look at formulas 20 years ago they didn't have maltodextrin in them maltodextrin is in there as a thickener and as a sweetener it has zero um nutritional benefit and it's it's almost worse than sugar it can contribute to constipation it can cause bloating and it can be an allergen in its own right so it's one of these really cheap food additives that the manufacturers are adding to some of the milks and um, there's some milks i can't remember the one off the top of my head but it's like 30 percent sugar like junk food for babies exactly it's so a why are you putting sugar into sugar like actually sugar not even not even sweetener derived from potatoes or something but pure sugar 32 percent into baby's formula that's 30 percent of everything that child is having at the age of six months is sugar there's no need to train them to their taste buds to 
that kind of sweetness exactly. is there no there isn't mm. and the, the, cha- the, the other challenge is that has a direct impact on the development of the gut microbiome which then leads to really poor eating habits because this child is looking for sugar not consciously mm. um, but their body is going to be looking for the sweetener things the sweeter things and i guarantee you this is like i hate to say it out loud but this is food ink yeah, like, yeah, yeah. food ink saying oh how can we get these people um addressed now there's a if i don't know if you fo- follow him or not mark hyman he's an amazing um functional medicine doctor in the states he runs a cleveland clinic and he was a regular doctor who changed and tra- trained in functional medicine now has his own podcast but we had he did an episode an interview um he was being interviewed by sean stevenson on the model health show and he's talking about how he met up with one of the mds of a large pharm- pharmaceutical company i can't remember or a large food company it might have been Kraft or mars or somebody i can't remember who and this md was telling him about how exciting it was that their new research department was about the addictive centers in the tongue and that they are engineering the food to be directly addictive and you're like okay i think we need to stop being naive and saying they're not doing that to baby formula when sugar in it i mean they are because these things then lead to consumers repeat buying you know, and we have a three year window at the beginning of baby's life to give them the best start in laying down their gut microbiome blueprint. And that will give them that underpins lifelong health. The gut microbiome can be changed. This is really important because I know um, some parents freak out going, oh my God, my child's not got a great gut microbiome. It can be changed. It's just more difficult to do after the age of three, Mm. you know? Get children who will refuse green food it's like well why they're refusing green food it's not because it doesn't taste good it's generally because of again and this is where you look at things like you know we ask about things that are seemingly unrelated so if mom and dad don't eat the green things your kid's not going to eat the green things mm. you know if your kids see you watching telly five minutes before you go to sleep that's what they're going to want to do mm. you know so it's all about behaviors in the family environment as well um mm. But yeah, the modeling foods early on are so important. Um, I think I've gone a bit off topic there, but yeah, reflux. No, it's really interesting. And I think as much as um, we, you know, we encourage breastfeeding um, as much as possible, but I know for some people it's not possible um, or it's, you know, there can be various reasons that formula is essential. Um, But actually knowing this, I I would be going, well, I'm going to research my formula and to the best that I can. do we need to add a probiotic? Do we need to consider, you know, you need to know what you're putting into your, your child. So um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's really interesting. And it, it confirms what I suspected with zero research or backup to this, but I wondered if actually this was the whole reflux and, and digestion was on the increase as being problematic for babies because it looks that way to me. And um, so it's great to, well, not great, but it's obviously, it's reassuring to know that I'm, I'm not imagining that and that you're seeing that that is true. Um, but we can do something about it. That's the, that's the thing. It can be resolved. And I, I love that we have people like you and that you're spreading this goodness by sharing your knowledge like you are today, but also training people to be able to help other people with this. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. It really is. I, yeah, I think you're doing wonderful work. I just, to, to finish up, I just want to make sure that everybody who's watched this understands that, first of all, you're the expert in your child. You know, Lucy, you know about sleep. I know about reflux, but I do not know your child. So when we go talk about resolving reflux, we do it as a, you know, mm-hmm. together. Yeah. Even the online courses, I teach you the special bits about reflux, but you put them into the, 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 the pattern that fits with your baby, yeah. you know, and it's, it's a joint thing. So we're all the experts. We need to start taking ownership. And I think that's one of the things that the coronavirus outbreak is going to do over the next few months. So we're going to start taking a bit more ownership of our lives again. You know, yeah. as parents, we are the custodian of their health until they're old enough to make their own decisions. And as far as I'm concerned, as long as our motives 
as parents are that I can say, hand on my heart, when my child is 16, this is what I did. This is the information I had at the time to base that decision on. And I did the best I possibly could. That's all our children can ask us. Yeah. You know, and as long as we say, even if we, when we get new information, we can then process it and go, yeah, I want to act on that. Or you go to the stage and go, that doesn't sit right with me, so I'm not going to act on it. Mm. Both responses are equally fine, as long as you're not actually going, mm, exactly. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything because it's too difficult. Actually, I watched an amazing film last night, Tomorrowland, um, and in it, uh, Hugh Laurie, as sort of the, yeah, I won't say who he is, but he makes a statement which, like this is made in 2015, it's so accurate. It basically says we always have the ability to change our future. And we can be heading down one path or we can be heading down another. Um, but if we don't generally create the future we want because it doesn't require us, or sorry, no, we, we're heading towards this doom future because it doesn't require any action of us today. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we take action today, mm -hmm. we actually directly influence where the next day is going to end up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I see so many parents go, I'm going to wait and see what the doctor says. I'm going to wait and see what the doctor says. I'm going to wait and see what the pediatrician says in three months. I'm like, that's fine. That's your decision. Mm -hmm. The information I give you today, you could have completely resolved reflux and changed your life by next week. Yeah. Yeah. And being the expert for your own child is key because like you said, there's a parent, actually, it's a wonderful, wonderful world we live in now where we have so many resources and we have the internet and we have people like ourselves that offer these services. But as a parent right now, you could go, okay, well, I, I know my child best, but I need to know more about reflux. So I'm going to take on your program and then I can tool, tool up and equip myself to be great with that. Okay, I need to address sleep, right? So I can take Lucy's program. I can gain the expertise. And actually as a parent, you can combine my knowledge and Anya's knowledge and any other professional who knows what they know about their thing. And yeah. you can then become the superpower expert for yeah. your child and, and do everything, you know, the best way for them as an individual. And I think it's amazing that we have that um, ability to do that. Yeah. Really I, I think that what you've just said is a like combining the information from different sources mm. it's just so so powerful and then as parents we have the ability to put them into a package for the individual of our child, individual child because they're not all the same yeah, yeah. they're no two the same even the same <laughs> and this is the thing with reflux um mums like this comes back to sort of mums and all the breastfeeding counselors would say this a mum's breastfeeding relationship with one child is not the same as the breastfeeding relationship with the next. So mum comes to me and says, well, my first child had reflux and we did this and worked, but it's not working for that child. It's like, because they're a different person. And mum, you're a different person as well. Mm. You know, in, in the two, three years since the previous child was born, almost every single cell in that mother's body, other than her hair at the ends, has completely regenerated. Every yeah. single cell is a different one who, that was present two years previous. Yeah. So we are different people. And it's almost stop trying to fit every door with the same key. Yeah. You know, let's get the right key for the right door. And yeah. it makes life a lot easier. It really does. It really, really does. Oh, well, it's so great to also see the, the, you know, the outcomes for people who are taking action and that are saying, no, I want to get this right and do the best I can and, and, um, and sharing what a difference it's made to their lives. And I think it's important right now, at any time, but especially right now, for everyone to be taking great care of themselves and their children and their well-being all around. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we've, got, we've got some brilliant resources. So um, let's make sure we share those uh yeah. links in in our comments and all our various different places and um and people then can know where they can go and take, make that first step uh, in the right direction i think what's really important maybe we should put this in the comment at the, at the beginning of this lucy yeah. um, is that right now i think we both have online services so people don't need you don't need to wait until you go to the doctor again to to resolve reflux you don't need to wait to get help with the sleep and that's one of the benefits of, of, you know, we can help weather this storm and you can still make life easier while you're stuck at home with Corona, hopefully without coronavirus, but while yeah. it's the world. 
and you can yeah. still progress your life and, and still move on and get even better relationships with everybody at home Definitely. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And if you are stuck at home, um, precautionary or otherwise, you know, you, you can, you can tap into these tools and why not, rather than reading the news every five minutes, why not do something really amazing for your family and use that time wisely?